From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Crosswalk. As we continue in our series, Crossroads, we come to the last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Getting through chapter 3 has taken some time, but it contains three very important principles to talk about. Today, we look at the third principle from chapter 3, as the Apostle Paul urges us to consider God's wisdom instead of the world's. Here's Pastor Clay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, praise team. Thank you all. Appreciate it so much. We, uh, they did a great job today in worship and, uh, and setting up. We're shorthanded. We're kind of shorthanded. A lot of folks, like I said, traveling. I uh, didn't mention earlier, but uh, our student pastor, Cale, uh, got a last-minute call, went to preach uh, actually at Steve Pierce's church uh, up near Creedmoor when uh, Steve was out of town and his youth pastor was supposed to preach, and he woke up very sick today. And so Cale uh, went up there and going to deliver it hot off the press. It's fresh. Going give it, to give it to him this morning. So... Uh, We've been praying uh, for him as well, so that's good, right? Man, I'm glad to be back with you. See, and I were gone uh, last uh, weekend. Uh, her dad turned 80, and they had an 80th birthday party for him, and that was great and uh, fantastic and all that kind of stuff, but always uh, glad to be back and uh, be among uh, family and have an opportunity to, to preach. I like it. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, this past, uh, just recently, November 8th, November 8th, uh, 26 years ago, uh, this past November 8th, I surrendered to vocational ministry full-time and uh, started a, a journey back. And so I, I was passionate about preaching then. I'm still passionate about preaching now. I love to communicate the truth of God's Word. And I love uh, having the opportunity to study God's Word and God getting uh, to reveal things to me that I just uh, hopefully have the opportunity to communicate Uh, To you, I'm very, very uh, grateful to get to do that. So I'm glad you're here, uh, because as I like to say, preaching to people is a lot more fun than preaching to empty seats. So thank you for being and filling up your seat. If you know somebody that doesn't have a church home, we got a seat for them, and we'll fill that one up too, right? Right, 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 right. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, If you come here regularly, you probably know that. Matter of fact, you probably just then were thinking, again? Again? Yes, again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and I will confess to you that our journey through 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I knew the series overall. It's going to take a long time, right? We're going through 1 and 2 Corinthians. That's okay. I don't mind. If Jesus calls us home, uh, then we'll, we'll just hear it straight from the Apostle Paul uh, but, or Jesus or whoever wants to. But uh, in the meantime, if he, if he leaves me here, if he leaves you all here, we'll, we'll make our way through 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, and hopefully learn along the way who the church is supposed to be, what the church is supposed to be, uh, corporately and individually, and what that means for our lives. So I will confess to you that it has taken longer, uh, though, to get through chapter 3 than I really anticipated that it would. Having said that, however, I would not have wanted to necessarily speed it up any, Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there are three, uh, I believe that there are three uh, specific uh, ideas that needed to be looked at individually. But at the same time, looking at them individually, it also needs to be understood that there is a connection between these three, or there's a, yeah, there's a connection between these three main kind of ideas that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The first one that we looked at a number of weeks ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 was this principle, uh, this this idea that that followers of Jesus Christ are called to grow up. If you were here, do you remember that one? Grow up. And and because it's been a few weeks and because we're coming to the end of chapter 3, I'm going to read those verses uh, to you again just as a quick reminder. And I... Uh, brethren could not speak to you as spiritual men in other words paul's saying man i I, I want it to but i couldn't listen to what he says i I could not speak to you as as mature or spiritually mature men and 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 it would be people in general but as to men of flesh as to infants in christ ouch (laughs) i gave you milk to drink not solid food for you were not yet able to receive it Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, 
Are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? Notice what he's pointing out. Your actions are revealing who you really are, how you're really living your life. For when one says, and here it comes again, he's brought this up. For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? There is an expectation that a person that comes into a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, is to grow up. They are to mature in their walk and their faith in Jesus Christ. There comes a point where a person has to move on from the, from the elementary things of Christianity uh, God, He's creator, He created everything. Uh, your sin, you, you, you have sinned, you've messed up, that sin separates you from God. Uh, God uh, did something about it though, He sent His Son to die. You understand, it's, it's the basics of, of Christianity in a sense. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not important, it's, it's Christianity 101, but, but Paul's saying there's a, there comes a point where you have to move on from the, from the basics of Christianity into the deeper things of Christianity so that you can experience the greater things of Christianity, of following Christ. So you've got to grow up. And when that happens, when you begin to mature in your walk, in your faith with Jesus Christ, that then gives you the opportunity for the second idea that we discussed, the the opportunity to build up. In verses uh, 5 and uh, 5 to 15, he says, uh, What then is Apollos? And, and, And what is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, But God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. That that church that he was working with those new believers according to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder I laid a foundation and another is building on it but each man must be careful how he builds on it for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is say it Jesus Christ say it Jesus Christ now if any man builds on the foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a, say it, reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. A lot in there, obviously, and if you missed that message, you might want to go back and watch it or listen to it on our podcast uh, or, or, or from our website. You can, you can see them there as well, where we discussed, you know, what, what are these rewards? What is this fire, this judgment? What are all those things? But what, what is clear is Paul is building a case for the fact that uh, you and I uh, can, can build up treasures, rewards in heaven whatever all that means, rewards in heaven based on what we build our life on here and now. And he says, if, if you build your life on, on this world, on the material, if, if, if the aspirations of your life are to, or, are to just live in this life, and it's not even necessarily, I, I think I said this, when we, I'm not even necessarily saying, you know, a life of debauchery and deep sin and all that kind of stuff. Yes, the, People can go down that road, but, it's not, but it, it's not even that. It's just if your focus is this world, this material world, this now, what I got to get done, where I got to have this, what, what I have to reach, what I, all this stuff that I have to do. If, if that is the aspirations of your life, then Paul says that's like wood, hay, and straw. And in the fiery judgment of God, it's just burned up. It, 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 won't, it, it won't last any longer than this life. You understand? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't go beyond the grave. If, however, on the other hand, you choose to build your life on on spiritual values, and they're compared to gold, silver, and precious stones. If you, as Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 6, decide in your individual life that you're going to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, 
everything else, whatever else, all this, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in and through my life. If, if that is your ambition, your goal, if that's the, the purpose and, the, and the, the desires of your life, then Paul says that's like building with spiritually valuable material. And that material will, will pass through the fire judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, and will result in rewards for your life. You have an opportunity to build up whatever all it means. And as I said a few weeks ago when we got to that passage of Scripture, I don't know what all it means, but if God wants to give it to me, I know it's going to be good. And so uh, I, I'm willing to, to take whatever He would, would graciously give to me as I try and uh, just serve Him for His purposes. That's what He said. Grow up. If you grow up, then, you can, then you're in this place where you can build up, which then leads to the third concept or idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that, that, that we're looking at today, and that is to wise up. To wise up. Listen to what he says. I'm going to read verse 16 through 23. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you if you're in Christ. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to you. Paul, moving through this, this letter, this charge to grow up, this charge to build up. Think about these rewards that God desires to give you in your life. And whatever all uh, causes it, but no doubt part of it was the fact that as he's, as he's discussing, as he's thinking about it, and as he's writing, he's, dis, he's discussing... Uh, this idea of, of building up, this idea of, of growing up in Christ, this, talking about these rewards, these eternal rewards, talking about building on precious or valuable spiritual material, all of that causes Paul to ask, as he's moving forward, it causes him to ask an astounding question. This is an astounding question, ladies and gentlemen. And yet, it sounds as if Paul expects the Corinthians to know the answer to this question. When he says uh, there in verse 16, don't you know, don't you know that you are the temple of God? Back then, and obviously still today, billions of people. When they hear the word temple, they think of a place built by human hands where you go to, to worship a deity. Right? They went to the temple. Uh, te whether you're talking in, in Asia or India or, or wherever, if somebody talks about temple, somebody hears the word temple, they think of a place where you go to, that was built by human hands, that you go to, to worship a deity. There in Corinth was this, this famous, and it was famous, temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, where thousands and thousands of people from all over the known world would travel and go up, the, it, it, over, it sat on this big hill and overlooked the city of, of uh, Corinth. And they, they, would, they would go up to the temple of the goddess of love to worship the goddess of love. 
but because of the love of the one true God? Because of the work of his nail-pierced hands? God has built you and I into the temple of God. It is an astounding thought. We wouldn't necessarily know it by reading the text in English, but in the original language that the New Testament was written in, and, and, and most of you know the New Testament was written originally in Greek, in the original language that the New Testament was written in, there are actually two words for a temple, for the English translation, uh, temple. Uh, there is the word hiera, which in the New Testament would, would be a reference to the, the overall temple. Okay, temple mound, if you will. It would be everything. It would be the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women. It would be the, 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 the bronze laver and the sacrificial altar part. And it, it would be the, the priest's uh, residence. And it's, it's the overall uh, temple mound, the whole complex. That's the hiera. It's the temple. But there's another word for temple in the New Testament. And it is the word naas. And naas is used to refer to the specific part of the temple that was known as the holy of holies. That, that particular part of the temple where only the high priest could go behind the, the veil. This veil that separated, that, that, that pictured or represented the, the separation between God and man because of our sinfulness and God's holiness. Where the Ark of the Covenant dwelled in there. Y'all know what the Ark of the Covenant is? Anybody ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? The Ark of the Covenant sat in there. And the high priest could go behind that veil and only the high priest could go behind that veil and could only go one time a year to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat which was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the place where, that represented God coming down and dwelling among His people. It was truly the most holy of places. And Paul says to the Corinthians and to you, to me, this morning, don't you know that you are, and guess what word he uses, the naas? Don't you know that you are that most holy, sacred place? That, that the, the Spirit, and the reason is, is unfathomable, I, I admit, the very Spirit of God dwells in you. Don't you know that you're the temple of God? It is an astounding idea. And it's a question that Paul seems to indicate that the Corinthians should know. But still, it's astounding to think. Don't you know that you are the naas? You are that set-apart place. You're that sacred place. You're that place built by His nail-pierced hands that made it possible for you to have a relationship with God because of His sacrifice. And now the very Spirit of God dwells in you. Listen, I, I know that's the idea of the Spirit of God dwelling in us and... and and how that can be, and, and perhaps even more important, why that would be. Why would the Spirit of God choose to dwell in me? I, I realize that that kind of thing is, is really beyond comprehension of, of mortal men. And yet, by faith, we can accept it and therefore heed the very serious warning in verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Now listen, this, this verse has probably had its share of misunderstanding and, and, and misuse. But I, I want to say to you that, th that this... Paul is not saying here that if, if, a, if a person who knows Christ uh, destroys their body somehow, that God will then destroy them, that, that, that 
this is not teaching annihilationism, okay, that, that you, that, or that you can lose your salvation. In fact, uh, the word destroy and defile are the, actually the same word in Greek. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but des- it, it, destroy always, is always used in a future tense when it, when it shows up. But, but the point is, probably a better understanding of the text would be um, to spoil or to ruin or to corrupt If anyone spoils the temple of God, if anyone corrupts the temple of God, if anyone ruins the temple of God, and uh, just quick quiz, who's the Spirit of God? I mean, who's the temple of God? Yeah, say it, I am. If, if you know Christ is your Savior, the Spirit of God dwells, that's what he said, right? If anyone corrupts, if anyone ruins the temple of God, God will corrupt, will ruin, will spoil him. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, folks, wise up. Don't, don't, don't corrupt the very temple of God by living for this world. Don't, don't spoil the temple of God by choosing to live for the material world and for the fleshly side. I know we all have that stuff we got to do. He says, don't make that the priority of your life. Don't, don't make that the focus of your life because in essence, you're polluting the very temple of God. Now listen to me. Anybody that's run, read any bit of reading in the Old Testament having to do with the Holy of Holies, which is what you are now, right? Spiritually speaking, you're the Holy of Holies. Anybody that's done even a little bit of reading about the the temple in the Old Testament knows that the Jews had specific instructions on exactly how it was to be built, exactly what was to be in it, in it and exactly how they were to, to have access to, to the temple. And as I said just a second ago, the Holy of Holies, only, only the high priest could go there. And he could only go there once a year on Yom Kippur, on Day of Atonement. That's the only day he can go in there. The high priest had had uh, bells tied uh, to the tassels the, the, around his, his robe so that the people, because they couldn't go in there, but they could hear him moving around inside the Holy of Holies, and at least they know that God hadn't struck him dead yet. And as I understand it, there was a rope tied around his ankle so they could pull him back out if God did. Because they sure couldn't go in there and get him. This is the Holy of holies. And Paul says, that's you. Why? Why would you corrupt the temple by living for this life, by indulging in whatever that, that you think is going to feed or satisfy or, or make you feel, when, when, it, when there's so much more that's so much more important, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Wise up. Paul has uh, has made it clear that there is a distinction between God's truth and the world's truth. Paul has made it clear that there is a distinction between the the world's wisdom and God's wisdom and ladies and gentlemen I know it's not good English it ain't even close in uh, in verse 19 he says for the wisdom of this world is what foolishness before God verse 20 the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are Useless. Do you understand why I keep saying to you throughout, and I've done this several times in this series, why I keep saying to you that you have to determine, nobody's going to do it for you, you have to decide what is your source of truth. Where, what are you going to base your life on? You, you can go the world's way. Listen, you can go the world's way. You can choose the world's truth. You can choose the world's morality. You can choose the world's uh, wisdom. Or you can choose God. You can't choose both. It's basically what he's saying. His. You, you, can't, you can't pollute the temple by, by living as, as if, you understand you understand? So, I would say to you, choose your source of wisdom carefully that you build your life on. 
Whether you are here and you're 8 or 18 or 80, choose your source of wisdom carefully. Because it not only impacts this life, but it impacts the life to come. Let me just say this um, real quickly. When, when I surrendered to ministry, I said a moment ago, November 8th, uh, 1992, I, I went forward on Sunday night service, publicly surrendered. I was doing youth ministry kind of part-time, but I was, I was a postmaster, and, and that, that was fine, and that was good. But November 8th, 1992, I surrendered to vocational full-time. just felt like God was asking me to, to walk away, leave it all, and go and, and do this. Listen, I'm not bragging, sort of, but... We, we, had a, we, had a pretty, we had a pretty sweet life. I mean, we had, we had land, and we had a big house, and we had the four-wheelers and the swimming pool and motorcycles and all that stuff. I became a postmaster at 30 years of age. Nobody becomes a postmaster at 30, okay? And, I, and I, when, when I went and told my dad, he thought I'd lost my ever-loving mind. He really did. He thought I'd lost my ever-loving mind. I told him I was going into ministry. Going to have to leave the postal service. Got to go back to school because I dropped out one semester into my freshman year, 18 years of age. Students, stay in school. But I didn't know what I want to do with my life, so I dropped out. But so I was going to have to go back and go, go to college. Three and a half years to finish my BA. Three and a half years to finish my Master of Divinity. Three and a half years to finish my doctor. Ten years of my life. My family's life sucked up in... Schooling. And, I, and I'm walking away from all of it. No, and, and my dad, listen, my, my dad knew Jesus. My dad's in heaven. I, I really believe he's in heaven now, but he thought I'd lost my ever-loving mind. Now he's got, I'm sure he's got concern for our family and grand, you know, all this stuff, but you understand what I'm saying? There's the world's wisdom and there's God's wisdom. And, and, you, and you just have to choose which, which you're going to follow and what direction you're going to go. In your life as God is leading you. Psalm 51, verse 6 says this. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. That's, that's what God desires, for you to have his wisdom that would guide you through life. And uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 9, thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, there's wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. The bottom line is this, you can choose the world's direction, the world's wisdom, the world's, and, and it's constantly, you're constantly being bombarded with it, right? Or you can, you can choose to go with God. You can't do both. In the first part of chapter 3, we find the admonition to grow up in our faith. In the second part, we're challenged to build up treasures in heaven by building our life on Jesus Christ. And as we looked at today, in verses 16 to the end of the chapter, we're called to wise up. Wise up the reality that we are the very temple of God. Because of that, we shouldn't focus on man's wisdom or man's idea of truth. But instead, seek to honor God by living His wisdom, morality, and truth. The world may think we're foolish, but God says that placing our lives in His hands is the wisest thing we'll ever do. We invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere to celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross-culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about a relationship, a community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person, real people who truly care, solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens, and the most energetic, fun, and safe kids program around. Find out more at crossculture.church. Cross Culture Church in North Raleigh, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.